Hello everybody and welcome to the Dry Dock episode 250. This week the questions are taken from guides 302 and 303, that's the guides to the Tudor vessel Elizabeth Jonas and HMS Africa of 1781, with the Wednesday videos on the US Pacific Submarine Campaign for the first half of 1943 and the US 2022 tour video for USS Massachusetts, with an extra question or two thrown in from the follow-up to the Cordite video. John A. Schult asks, what is the name of the small mast behind the mizzen and how long did it survive in ship design? Was it done away with when the galleon style evolved into the typical three-masted ship of the line we all know and love? This is called the Bonaventure mizzen, or sometimes just called the Bonaventure, and it's basically a slightly smaller version of the mizzen mast. It hung around for a about as long as the mizzen mast was rigged just with the latine sail. This is the great Harry or Henry Grasadier, depending on whether you want the colloquial or formal name for it. Basically Henry VIII's flagship. And as you can see, she is equipped with four masts. So foremast, mainmast, mizzen mast, and then Bonaventure mizzen right there at the back. As far as how long this hangs around for, people stop putting it on ships circa the end of the 16th, beginning of the 17th century, so as the 1500s turn into the 1600s. However, because obviously ships in those days last several decades, if they're well taken care of, it takes pretty much most of the first half of the 1600s, i.e. the early 17th century, um, for this all to die away. So when you consider plans and paintings of the Armada, which is 1588, so late 16th century, quite a number of the largest Armada galleons are carrying four masts, and some of them, okay, are old, but some of them are relatively new-built ships, whereas by the time you get to, the, say, the Four Days Battle, the uh, as part of the Second Anglo-Dutch War, which is in 1666, which is just about into the uh, latter half of the 1600s, basically everybody at that stage with their largest vessels is using three-masted vessels. And then you wind back to the First Anglo-Dutch War, which is essentially exactly in the middle of the 1600s. And again, pretty much everyone's using three-masted vessels. And then immediately before that, and also a ship involved in both First and Second Anglo-Dutch Wars, you have the Sovereign of the Seas, which is a 1630s vessel, and there's a little bit of argumentation going on as to exactly how many masts that vessel had, because it is known for certain that she had a little mast mounted to her bowsprit, but obviously that's not a main uh, part of the masting of the hull itself. And so, depending on which book you read, sometimes uh, Sovereign of the Seas is described as a three-masted vessel, sometimes a four-masted vessel, and sometimes people interpret that four-mast four-masted vessel to be four masts on the hull, kind of like the Great Harry here, and sometimes they interpret that to mean three masts on the hull plus a uh, mast on the bowsprit, which wasn't uncommon back in those days. And the, unfortunately, the paintings that we have that depict Sovereign of the Seas around about this time are also equally contradictory as to exactly how many masts she had and where they go. So that's kind of when it dies out. The man formerly known as Commenting is What I Do asks, I remember always hearing about how North Carolina's 16-inch guns fit incredibly well in the mounts for the 14-inch guns. Was this the happy accident it's often portrayed as, or was the US Navy pulling its own version of what the Japanese did with the Megami class? It's not quite the US Navy doing its own version of the Japanese with the Megamis, but almost. So... I mean, at some point I have to do a video on the design history of the North Carolinas because it was all over the place. Um, you know, Mr. Conspiracy Theory Wall has nothing on the amount of weird and wonderful designs that went into the North Carolinas conception. But rather interestingly, 1935, there was a note put in with the design which asked, look, can we potentially explore the idea of designing the quad 14 inch battery in such a way that it can be easily substituted for a triple 16 and they were told no but then as the negotiations for the second london naval treaty continued and it looked more and more likely that japan wasn't going to sign up um, the same question was raised again in a different section of the design team 
and that was accepted. And that seems to be the last mention that su of such a change being built into the ship's design was made, with it being met with a, an affirmation, a positive, i.e., yes, let's uh, make sure that that is in place. And then, of course, you went through, well, there was an election year in 1936, and then uh, the it became ever increasingly obvious that the escalator clauses, both to 16-inch and 45,000 tonnes, were going to have to be invoked. The 16-inch clause was invoked first, and then it was, relatively speaking, simple to design triple 16s to fit instead of quad 14s because of that aforementioned previous design work. So it wasn't that the US went out of its way to specifically say, right, we are going to design a ship explicitly with the intention of switching over to 16-inch guns at some point in the future. But during the design process, they did acknowledge that, you know, we may very well be in a period where we're designing for 16-inch battleships very soon. So it's good to leave that in the design options. And then, obviously, as it turned out, they were correct in that assumption. So that design option was taken up. Brendan Boersdorf asks, under what circumstances could the Spanish Armada have defeated the British fleet? There are a variety of circumstances in which that could have happened, but, well, the two simplest ones would be either the... Um, and by the way, before we go on, just to note, it's the English fleet at this point, because we're still talking reign of Elizabeth I. It would be more accurate to call it the British fleet after the reign of Elizabeth I, when obviously James I of England is also King of Scotland. And then once you get the Act of Union, it's very definitely the British fleet. But nonetheless, anyway, the two main circumstances which could very easily and plausibly have happened where the Spanish Armada defeats the English fleet would be, one, if the wind suddenly backs around. So if, let's say, well, the Spanish Armada sailing in its big crescent formation from west to east down the English Channel, the English fleet is following them. If suddenly the wind shifts and it's now barreling down from Dover heading out into the Atlantic, if the Armada can do a 180 quickly enough, it could then descend on the English fleet and overwhelm it in close quarters action. Or similarly, if the wind doesn't shift and the English fleet is obviously conducting its hit and runs as it historically did up the channel and they overcommit and they actually end up, perhaps the wind picks up a bit more strongly or they just misjudge the distances or whatever, but basically they end up in close contact. Fundamentally, if you can engineer some kind of circumstance where the English fleet ends up in close quarters combat with the Spanish Armada prior to the attack of the fire ships, you will end up with uh, an English defeat. And the English fleet was very, very well aware of this, which is why they refused to get into close quarters until after the fire ship attack had significantly broken up the Spanish formation. Because as a rule, the average Spanish vessel was bigger than the average English vessel, and they had considerably more soldiers aboard. So as long as it was a gunnery action, the English ships had the advantage because they could shoot lots of guns and they could shoot lots of guns repeatedly. And being a bunch of men armed with muskets and bills and swords and all sorts of other melee weapons didn't really make much odds. But the minute you get into close quarters and you can start grappling, then having higher sides and more troops suddenly becomes a colossal advantage and you'd very rapidly overwhelm your smaller opponents as a general rule. Scott Mason asks, I was watching Ocean Liner Designs when they did a video called Five Absolutely Terrible Ship Makeovers and he mentioned a naval seaplane tender called Albatross which was converted into a very weird looking migrant ship called the SS Hel Hellenic Prince. Which got me thinking, were there any other warships that got some horrific modifications made either to to them that made them either look like they were beaten with the ugly stick or made the ships operate worse than before they got modified? Oh, there are there are quite a few, regrettably. Um, here's the Hellenic Prince, for those of you who don't know. It's a really weird one, actually. I mean, you can see, obviously, its origins as a seaplane tender. The reason I say it's a weird one is that when you look at shots of it from the bow or from the port or starboard front quarter, it almost looks like a normal liner of some description. It's only when you can actually see past amidships to the stern that you're like, what the heck? 
a bit of it's missing. <laughs> Nonetheless, there are a few other ships that really, really didn't get hit with anything good when they got modified. Um, I've mentioned quite a few times before, poor old HMS Tiger and Blake. They were, relatively speaking, decent looking-ish cruisers. And then someone decided just to take a gigantic metal shoebox and slap it on the back and call them helicopter amphibious assault cruisers, which, yeah, makes about as much sense as it sounds. Um, then, well, going back, actually, the tradition of the Royal Navy putting odd shaped boxes in places they really weren't welcome. Um, HMS Vindictive, one of the Effingham class cruisers, uh, that's all the um, basically early heavy cruisers, sometimes called the Drake class or whatever. It's one of those weird classes where, depending on which reference you see, it's named after almost every single one of the ships in that class. But nonetheless, um, they decided to turn uh, the Vindictive, which was one of them, into an aircraft carrier or a proto-aircraft carrier, very much in the vein of HMS Furious, where you know the front part stays cruiser-ish, kind of, and the back part has a flight deck and there's a box hanger installed, and it's just, it's really, really not a good sight. Um, and fortunately, or unfortunately, depending on your perspective, uh, the Royal Navy is not the only party that is guilty of this. So if anybody really wants to uh, watch their eyeballs melt, then you can go and have a look at USS Albany, which looks like a perfectly normal and regular heavy cruiser in her early photos and then when they converted her the main point of the conversion seems to have been to just stretch her superstructure on the z-axis with no regard for the laws of physics or aesthetics or anything else so <laughs> you end up with this thing where if, if you didn't see the rest of the hull if you just saw a profile picture of the superstructure from maybe one deck above the upper deck you'd think that the US Navy had gone in for some kind of streamlined variation on British battleship design. And then you realise that what is essentially a streamlined battleship superstructure has been slapped on top of some poor innocent cruiser. And yeah, the stability curves on the Albany must have been interesting, to say the least. Derek Storm asks, why did the Royal Navy have so many ships over the centuries, either on their own or by their class, named in quite demeaning ways? Was this a jest, since some options such as HMS Terrible are so obscenely picked it seems like it was a deliberate joke, but then as a four-ship class named Inflexible, which brought this question to mind, are they just examples of British humour hitting a chord that the rest of the world may or may not chuckle along with? A lot of it is to do with one of two things. Either it's references or meanings that have become lost to us or less apparent to us over time. And the other is just where you know, we still have multiple meanings or in inferences for certain words that we understand, but perhaps it just our minds go to a slightly different place now as compared to back then. And that is actually two subtle variations on the theme. So, for example, if we, say, take the bomb vessel HMS Carcass, now that sounds very odd because obviously these days, if, well, even that these days, not so many people know what a carcass is, but the ones that do, the first thing and pretty much the only thing that will ever come to your mind if someone says carcass, unless you're in some very, very specific trades, is a dead body. So why would you name a ship after a dead body? You know, HMS Rotting Corpse is not exactly particularly motivational. But back then, Carcass had a number of different meanings. There were uh, elements of fortifications that were known as carcasses. There was Carcass Shot, um, which was a, a type of munition, which is actually what the ship was named after. And you know, there was a much wider variation of the use of this word, but most of those uses have fallen by the wayside, as I said, and except for some very, very particular niche trades. And so to the modern ear, it sounds really weird. Now, when it comes to the other half of things, you have names like HMS Terrible. We still have the meaning that the Royal Navy was implying in fairly common usage. It's just that for whatever reason, either society's minds or 
perhaps just some people's minds go to slightly different places. So yeah, you know, if you have something called HMS Terrible, admittedly, yeah, a lot of people nowadays will think, well, that's a dumb name because you're saying your ship is awful. In actual fact, what they look, what the Royal Navy is going for is a, a terrible, as in you know, terrible to your enemies. You know, it would be a terrible thing if this ship happened to you. I wouldn't want to visit this terrible fate on you. That kind of implication of terrible, as in one that strikes terror, and in that context, it is very fitting. The same thing with something like inflexible. These days used in the context of a person or a thing or something we've anthropomorphized, inflexible tends to mean, you know, rigorous, unbending, you know, very um, strict, not not particularly pleasant, you know, unable to adapt. Whereas the meaning of inflexible that the Royal Navy was going for was, you know, inflexible in the face of the enemy, so, you know, will not bend or break in the face of opposition, which is also a meaning that we use quite widely in society, but again, is not quite our default go-to these days, it would seem. And usually one of those two will be the explanation for almost all Royal Navy ship names that on the surface seem to be a little bit suspect. Um, there is obviously a couple of sm very, very small subclasses to that, one of which is just words that flat out don't exist anymore, though falling out of usage but may have been prevalent enough back in the day for the Royal Navy to name a ship after them. And the other one is words that have radically changed their meaning. And that those ones, although they're very rare, can lead to a lot of, you know, classic schoolboy giggling at some of the now modern implications of those names, as opposed to what they were aiming for uh, back then. So, for example... Um, Let's see if YouTube won't demonetize for this one just for mentioning it, but let's go, you know, the word gay, you know, back in World War II meant happy, uh, joyful, you know, skipping about, that kind of thing. Um, the, the most common usage of that word is obviously it's slightly different these days, but there's a whole class of patrol craft, which were named the gay class. And you can go look them up and, you know, have a good laugh at uh, what, they might, what the implications of some of those names might be nowadays, um, if you want to act like a 12 year old who thinks the word is just hilarious. Mr. Flack 188 asks Did many of the submariners actually put the torpedoes, that is the Mark 14 torpedoes, into contact fuse mode only? It seems that they had the option fairly early on, but they chose to continue trying the magnetic fuse. And once they, want, once they went contact only, how did they work? Well, it was split. Um, if you see the whole series I've done so far on the US Pacific submarine campaign, part of the area was quite happy for the, well, the F officers in the upper echelons were quite happy to get their subs to switch over to contact fusing only once the issues with the magnetic detonator became apparent. But because you had the central and southwest Pacific areas with primary areas involved in combat with the Japanese. In the other area, you had an officer who'd been instrumental in the development of the Mark VI Exploder, and he would not hear it. He just didn't want to know. So he said, nope, nope, don't care what you're finding. Say, everybody is instructed to still keep the magnetic influencer on. And obviously that led to somewhat diverging results. Now, there were... Also, on top of that, you know, officers in submarines who switched off the magnetic influencer part anyway, regardless of what the upper echelon orders were. And once they switched over to contact fusing, again, this is part of the video both for the submarine series and for the Mark 14 torpedo. The problem was that whilst it solved some of the issues, it didn't solve all of them because the Mark 6 exploder was just fundamentally flawed in so many ways. Um, it's at this stage of development that even the contact fuse didn't normally, well, I wouldn't say normally work. It didn't work under a lot of different circumstances, including a rather classic direct perpendicular impact. So you got a slight increase in um, successful hits and successful detonations by using the contact only mode on the Mark 14, but it didn't entirely solve the problem because the contact part of the detonator was also somewhat faulty. David Knowles asks, uh, 
It seems that the main guns on battleships, or the turrets, are held in place by their sheer weight more than anything else, and this is the reason why wrecks such as Bismarck seem to be missing their guns. However, it seems a lot of smaller shipwrecks, such as cruisers and destroyers, still have theirs in place, and in some cases those guns are still trained on an enemy that's long since gone. Were these turrets fixed more to the hull, or is it a case of more lighter guns more likely to stay in place? Now, there are a few things to point out here. Firstly, there are turret clips, or holding down clips, whatever you want to call them. They're basically C-shaped or U-shaped um, lumps of metal, and they do what the name suggests. The idea is that they will connect the turret, or at that point the turret ring, to the barbette, obviously in such a way that allows the turret to rotate freely, but means that it can't easily fall off or jump off. And this was deployed around the turn of the 19th to the 20th century. So iron turreted ironclad vessels, unless they're using something like, say, an Ericsson turret where there's a spindle that goes much deeper into the ship, turret, turreted ironclad vessels are much more vulnerable, and even some pre-dreadnoughts, much more vulnerable to losing their turrets when they roll over in their process of sinking. But post-1900, most ships that have turrets, not all, to be fair, but most, will have turret clips, and that should stop them uh, from having their turrets fall out, even if they capsize. There's a couple of fairly easy-to-point examples. Nagato, for example, her turrets have been I think Nagato is upside down at an angle about 70 to 75 degrees. And so her turret's kind of hanging over open water for a little bit, and they haven't fallen out yet. But it's not a universal thing. Um, some of the German ships that were salvaged at Scapa Flow, their turret stayed on, even though they're upside down. Other German ships, uh, particularly Baden, turrets fell out, um, which led to some rather spectacular events surrounding her salvage. But that's another matter entirely. Uh, Bismarck, of course, rather famously, her main turrets have fallen out. And these turret clips, they're not actually specifically in there to keep the turrets in when the ship's capsizing, because to be honest, by the time the ship's capsizing, you really don't care what's going to happen to the turrets afterwards. They're actually mainly there to stop the turrets jumping off their roller path bearings in really heavy seas, or if they take a really heavy hit, that particularly one that doesn't penetrate their armour. Now... The problem you have with uh, various types of ship is that the turrets for a battleship's main armament are actually exponentially heavier than the turrets for cruisers and destroyers. So although obviously the centre of balance and the centre of gravity, etc. are all calculated similarly for most ships to get stability correct... Once you have filled a ship's hull with water, uh, or at least partially, you have a few issues when it comes to capital ships, particularly battleships. Their beam is a lot larger, so they're more prone to capsizing in the first place because they're more likely to get loads and loads of water enough to drag them down just down one side of the ship. Whereas a narrower beam ship like a destroyer or a cruiser, you're usually going to get flooding all across. But as I say, you also compare proportional weight. So ignoring the barbettes, just looking at the turrets... If you look at a Cleveland class cruiser, so it's got four triple turrets. So four triple six inch turrets collectively on a Cleveland, you're looking at about 800 tons of weight, which for four turrets is equivalent to about 7% of the ship's total mass. Whereas the three triple turrets on a South Dakota class battleship allow equate to about 14, well, just over 14% of the ship's total mass at standard displacement. And, of course, you have a heavily armoured conning tower and a few other bits and pieces above the centre, well above the centre of gravity on a battleship, which means that proportionally more of these very dense, very heavy objects are present high up on battleships as opposed to cruisers and destroyers, which also means, that, again, once you lose stability, they're very much more likely to flip over, which is going to put a lot of stress on the retaining clips and, of course, you know, we're talking about battleship turrets weighing several hundred, if not low thousands of tons. That's a lot of stress on some clips that may or may not already have been stressed or damaged. And thus failure is not necessarily entirely out of the question, depending on the violence of the ship sinking. Whereas for cruisers and destroyers, 
they're more likely in the first place to settle upright or vaguely upright. And even if they do flip over, the proportional weight that the Eclipse are being subjected to is a lot, lot less. And, you know, whilst battleship turret clips are obviously considerably thicker than those found on a cruiser or a destroyer, if the destroyer has turrets, then even so, you're talking about ultimate yield strengths of steel. And, you know, there are points where the load, the load from a battleship's turret is much more likely to just stretch and break the clip in the unusual circumstances than it would be for a similar situation on a destroyer or a cruiser. So it's just essentially, because of physics, much more likely to happen where a turret falls out on a battleship than it is on a cruiser or a destroyer. But as I said, it doesn't necessarily always happen either. But the other thing is, because of that rather top-heavy nature, thanks to the weight of the main armament and so forth, a lot of capital ships, when they sink, tend to end up upside down wholly or entirely, or potentially partially, which can make analysing whether or not the turret has fallen out rather difficult if uh, you can't actually get to it to examine. Real MCB asks, is the USS Massachusetts the only battleship left in the world to have engaged another post-Dreadnought battleship? I know that Belfast engaged Scharnhorst, but Belfast is a cruiser. Macars engaged the Russians at Tsushima, but obviously that was pre-Dreadnoughts. Yes, that would be correct, because, well, um, the only battleships that actually engaged a post-Dreadnought battleship in a straight-up gunfight, well, there's not that many, to be fair. I mean, if you if you classify the Congos as battleships, which, as I said before, I don't, but if you did, then Washington and South Dakota would be on that list, but obviously they are no longer with us. Bismarck was sunk by Rodney and King George V, and both of those have been scrapped. All of the QEs and Rs that took part in shooting at various Italian battleships in the Mediterranean are also all gone. All of the Pearl Harbor survivors that fought at Surigao Strait are gone. And then of the remaining battleships that have preserved as museum ships, uh, Texas didn't fight another battleship. The Iowas never actually ended up fighting a hostile battleship, and neither did Alabama. So yeah, process of elimination. Massachusetts is the only battleship left in the world as a museum ship that has engaged another post-Dreadnought battleship. Plasma Burn Death asks, After major battles, assuming that the battleship itself wasn't harmed, would the ship be capable of moving at slightly faster speeds after getting rid of so many 90-pound charges? Or would a ship have to be ballasted down to normal weight either way to avoid becoming unstable? A ship would actually, in theory, yes, be capable of moving a little bit faster through the water after a major battle, assuming it hadn't been damaged. But that's not actually due to the expenditure of her charges. It's more to do with the expenditure of everything else. So if you... Well, let's think about it. So let's say we're looking at a ship like USS Massachusetts. Assume that she's been in battle and she's expended, I don't know, let's, let's say she's fired... 50 salvos, 50 full salvos. So that's 50 um, sets of shells sent down the range. So that's 50 sets of six 90 pound charges. Well, that's 13.5 tons of propellant. That's not a huge amount. But assuming that all of those charges are Mark 8 Super Heavy Armor Piercing shells, she's sent 67 and a half tons of shells down range. So, you know, we're getting to a little bit more appreciable figures. Collectively, you're talking about 81 tonnes of weight expended. And if we say that at the rate of, let's say, roughly one salvo a minute, which is about average for battle, plus a few little breaks here and there, she's probably been fighting for an hour, and during that hour she's been moving at top speed, because you know, why not? So she's burned about roughly 12,000 gallons of fuel. That's about 91,500 pounds of fuel, which equates to about another 46 tonnes. So allowing for various other ancillaries, 
a battleship like Massachusetts, assuming she's not damaged, if she goes into an hour of extended combat, she's probably coming out the other side about 130 to 150 tons lighter, depending on exactly how long it lasts, exactly how many salvos are fired, and so on and so forth. Now, is that going to manifestly affect the ship's speed? Technically, yes, because that equates to maybe around about an inch and a half of her draft. So she's going to be riding an inch and a half higher in the water. So her fuel efficiency or her speed at a given power output will be just that fraction more. But it's not going to be a noticeably huge amount. Um, certainly, you know, a ch small change in sea conditions could have a significantly greater effect at that stage. However, um, if she's in a much more prolonged action, let's say she's fired off a hundred salvos worth of ammunition and she's been in battle maneuvering for, say, three hours or so, then you might start to look at, uh, you know, she's come up four, five, six inches out of the water just through fuel consumption and the shells and charges leaving the ship at high velocity, that might start to have a slightly more noticeable effect on her ability to move at a given uh, power output and what speed that power output reaches. It's still not going to be absolutely massive, but it might become noticeable. Jess Stewart asks, I noticed the Royal Navy diagram shown in the video about cordite indicate silk is specified very often for powder bags. I think I remember the US Navy also used silk for powder bags on battleships. What makes silk a better textile for dealing with powder and other propellants? Well, there are a number of secondary reasons why you might use silk as a powder bag. It's relatively light, it's pretty strong, um, the weave is usually relatively tight, which helps to retain most things inside it, which is fairly useful. Um, and because it's strong, it doesn't rip very easily, which is very important when you talk about propellant. But the single biggest reason, and the overriding above all other reasons for using silk as your propellant bag, is that when it burns, you know, when you fire the gun, it burns away completely without leaving any little patchy bits of residue that can smolder away and potentially set off the next lot of rounds that you're sending down range, which is massively important because the absolute last thing you want is to be loading your next round. Shell's gone in, great, fantastic. Then you load in your propellant and then the propellant ignites whilst the breech is open. And, you know, the shell is blocking the way out. So all of that explosion comes back into the turret. And that's usually quite bad news for you and everybody else who's in the turret. And potentially, if that flash gets down into the magazines, but very bad news for everybody else in the ship. Which, um, yeah, that, that really could be a risk if you used something like cotton um, or some other material for the propellant bags. And so silk is highly, highly useful in that regard. And that's why, unlike a lot of other things, you know, when you think about the type of explosive, um, the type of shell, the weight of shell, the size of shell, the velocity, etc. All of these things are very negotiable and very different between navies and sometimes even between different classes of ship. But once you get into the pre-dreadnought and then dreadnought period, pretty much everybody is universally using silk propellant bags for exactly this reason, because spontaneous ignition of propellant in the chamber of the gun is something that nobody wants. Tomas Dudkiewicz asks, why did the Americans stick to single turret destroyers when everyone else was going to doubles? It may seem a little bit odd at first when you look at the very late 1930s and the US destroyers are still, I mean, this is a Farragut class, this is in fact the Farragut, so a little bit earlier, but American destroyers wouldn't be that much different from the Farragut class. You know, single five inch 38s and some torpedo launchers. When you look at you know, the tribals, then the J's through N's all having twin mounts, the German destroyers usually having a mixture of twins and singles, the contra torpilleurs usually twins, the po even the Polish destroyers, Grom, Bliskovic, etc., a mixture of twins and singles, 
Tashkent, again, uh, twins. The Japanese have been doing twins since the Fubukis. So what gives? Well, there's a number of different reasons, but the exact balance of how much each reason applies to each nation varies, of course, on a national basis. So let's go through some of those reasons. Firstly, generally speaking, for a given amount of technology, i.e. let's say they have hoists, generally a single mount is a little bit quicker, both in training and elevation, and a little bit quicker in rate of fire. Now, that can be made up for partly if the twin mount, even if it fires slightly slower, is firing two shells. But if you have very limited deck space and you know, weight considerations and so forth, then five single guns blasting away might be able to put out slightly more shells over, say, a minute than three twin mounts. And now, obviously, this varies on a case by case basis. So for the Americans, given that they do have truly and fully dual purpose uh, weapons on their destroyers, it is a little bit more important to for absolute rate of fire. Another thing is machinery space. If uh, somebody's machinery space is taking up a lot of the linear length of the ship in terms of you know, vents and funnels and so forth, then deck space is more restricted. And so in order to maintain a reasonable number of guns, you might be forced to go with two or three twin mounts because at destroyer levels, twin mounts don't occupy a huge amount of additional uh, surface area, especially in terms of the length of the ship as compared to singles. So you can fit in two or three locations, four or six guns, whereas if you're trying to fit five single mounts, that might take up more real estate along the length of your ship than you might have available or might want to be making available if there's a large amount of space taken up by the ancillary elements of your machinery. So related to that is torpedo armament. If you've got a couple of, let's say, quad torpedo launchers, again, that takes a certain amount of real estate along the length of your ship. Whereas if you're, say, the Japanese and you have three triples or more, that takes up more real estate, which again would mitigate towards you using twin mounts in order to retain a decent number of weapons as opposed to spreading out a similar number of guns in slightly rap more rapid firing and faster tracking singles. There's also a certain efficiency of equipment with twin mounts. So if you need to have backup range finders and so forth, or just you know, trying to simplify your fire control solutions. Again, fewer mountings means you need fewer backup systems and it's a slightly less complex solution to solve for your fire control systems. Whereas if you can afford lots of different fire control systems or just a very complex fire control system, then having a si more single mounts might you know, have some benefit in terms of redundancy. Because if you have five or six guns, if they're all in singles, you lose one, well, you've lost one fifth or one sixth of your armament. Whereas if you have six guns in three twin mounts, you lose one, you've lost a third. Now that's not to say that twin mounts are all bad. They are certain advantages. The fact that, you know, three twin mounts gets you six guns, whereas five singles only gets you five. And the more typical twin mount setup where you have either a twin and a single or two twins up front, nets you quite a lot of forward firepower and destroyers are quite often aggressively attacking. So four guns up front is you know fairly hefty and in fact equals the firepower of a lot of older destroyers on their broadsides. Whereas if you have two singles up front, you've only got two guns, so half the firepower. So there is that advantage. Although again, you know, with Japanese destroyers very often having their two two twins aft and one twin forward, that's not so much the case. Fewer mounts means obviously also that you can have fewer magazines, so concentrated in a fewer areas, which means less of the ship is likely to explode upon being violently hit. And from a crew comfort perspective, twin mounts, because of their size and complexity, usually merit at least partial shielding, if not full enclosure, at a more regular a basis than single mounts do. And indeed, a lot of US 5-inch 38 single mounts, at least initially, were either open or partially shielded. And the fully shielded classic single 5-inch 38 you see later on occurs on in some places on early ships, but not in all of them. 
Now, once especially concerns about deck space show up in terms of you know other anti-aircraft weapons, 20 mils, 40 mils, and anti-sub equipment, then you start to see the US switch over with things like the Sumner and Gearing classes to twin mounts on their destroyers as well as you know everybody else doing that. Although it is interesting to note that a lot of wartime build destroyers, especially the UK emergency builds, go back from the twins, which the Royal Navy was adopting for its fleet destroyers, back to singles because they're simpler and easier to produce. And of course, the US did have experience with twin mounts on destroyers in the Summers, not the Summoners, and the Porters, which were destroyer leaders designed in the mid early to mid-1930s. But, well, let's just say the US hadn't had the world's best experience with those um, single-purpose twin 5-inch 38 mounts, which may also have explained a, a slight institutional recoil from the idea for a while. Vinve asks, after the Royal Navy and Royal Scots Navy were merged, what happened to the Scottish ships, men and officers? Did many of them have careers in the Royal Navy? Such as there were, yes. But the thing about the Royal Scottish Navy is that it had very, very much diminished. In fact, at points had even gone almost near enough extinct in the period between the Union of the Crowns in 1603 and the, near enough as makes no difference, century later Act of Union, which then made Scotland and England, which were up until that point two separate kingdoms, two separate countries that just happened to share the same monarch and therefore technically the same head of state, into the United Kingdom of Great Britain and, well, as it now stands, the United Kingdom of Great Britain and Northern Ireland. Um, at the beginning of that, there was a small Scottish navy, but during the effectively 1600s, the Royal Navy, being a significantly larger and more powerful organisation and under the command of the same monarch, tended to kind of just take over a lot of the duties of the Scottish Navy, although some elements of the Royal Navy, particularly squadrons based in and around Scotland, did tend to have predominantly Scottish crews and captains. They were still flying under the flag of the Royal Navy, not the Royal Scots Navy. And by the time you get to the Act of Union, um, well, there's actually been a period in the latter part of the 1600s where the Scottish Navy basically didn't exist, but had been very briefly revived by various efforts, including the Darien Expedition, which was the reason for the Act of Union, because Scotland managed to bankrupt itself trying to be an independent colonial power. And therefore, when the Act of Union came in and the Royal Scots Navy merged with the Royal Navy, there was a grand total of three ships that merited any mention that were transferred into the Royal Navy. Um, none of them were ships of the line. The biggest was a frigate. So, yeah, that there wasn't a huge, you know, amount of kerfuffle about the merger, albeit that some of the Scottish officers and men decided they didn't want to serve in the Royal Navy and went off to other places, particularly Scandinavia and Russia. But, you know... A reasonable chunk of the Scottish Navy that, and um, basically the ones that stuck around, they basically just folded straight into the Royal Navy. And the Royal Navy actually has a quite a long and storied history, both actually before the Act of Union and after, of significant admirals and captains and men from Scotland. So, you know, much as with the Highland regiments in the British Army, they seem to have handled the transition pretty well. Donovan Lawler asks, so I was watching the classic naval war film In Harm's Way, at least I think I was, and in any case, the film in question shows a destroyer emergency sorting from Pearl Harbor during the attack, going from cold peacetime stance to steaming in approximately 10 minutes. That seems like ludicrous Hollywood theatrics to me, but my question is, how long on average would it take various ship types, i.e. corvettes, sloops, frigates, destroyers, cruisers, battleships, carriers, etc., to go from peacetime in harbour condition to we're at war, we need to be away from here as sort of yesterday conditions. Now, I have answered a question similar to this before, but it's mostly focused before on the larger ships. But overall, the single largest question essentially comes down to what is the status of the ship while it's alongside? If it is dead cold, i.e. all of the boilers are off and it's relying purely on shore power, 
it's going to take a long time because you have to not just warm up the boilers, you have to warm up all sorts of other systems in the machinery um, to <laughs> before you can light off the boilers and then you have to build steam pressure from nothing and then eventually you'll get underway. So you could be talking four, six, eight, 12 hours if you're trying to light off uh, the boilers and raise steam depending on the ship size. Um, obviously, the bigger the ship, the longer it takes. You, you know, you could be talking half a day to a day. Um, if everything is absolutely stone cold and off, it could even be longer than that. Um, because at that point, you might as well be, you know, a tech priest trying to reawaken the machine spirit if the thing's completely dead and gone, if it's been shut down for months. But in more typical conditions, if you're alongside in peacetime, such as you mentioned Pearl Harbor during the attack, in most of the circumstances back in those days, it was common practice to keep one boiler going, maybe two, depending on the size of the ship, just ticking over, producing power for the ship, having a degree of steam pressure in the systems, to, partly just to keep the machinery vaguely warm. And that's one of the reasons why Nevada was able to get underway as quickly as she did, because she actually had more than one boiler online at the time, I, if I recall correctly, because she was in the middle of transferring from one boiler to another, because you basically daisy chain, you wouldn't keep one boiler going for weeks and weeks and weeks alongside, you might keep one going for a bit, then switch over to another, switch over to another. Um, but in any case, if you're, talk if you're talking about a ship that's doing that, well, a typical destroyer might only have two to four boilers. So if they've got, let's say, four boilers, like a Fletcher class, and they've got one of them online, then getting that up to pressure and getting being therefore being able to get underway might not actually take that long. Um, it's not going to be going full pelt for certain because they'll be scrambling to get the other three boilers awake. But one boiler that was you know running everything on the ship and was almost ready to to go. That could actually, you know, get up to at least a, a working pressure to get the propeller turning much faster than you might otherwise think. And of course, if you're really lucky, if your sh ship's either a small destroyer that runs on two boilers, so you've got half your power available, or just under because it won't be running full tilt um, initially, or a four boiler destroyer that's in the like Nevada in the middle of transferring between two, uh, then you could get underway very quickly. But obviously, if you are a battleship and you might have you know, 12, 18, 20 boilers and you've only got one or two online, it's going to be actually more realistically taking you hours to get steam up. Dave Collier asks, a few dry docks ago, you introduced us to the Lacoste ship break. Could you tell us some more about this wonderfully steampunk invention? Well, here is one fitted to the USS Indiana. And yeah, pretty much is what it looks like. It's a giant reinforced metal barn door, in this case shaped to the profile of the hull of the Indiana, so lie as flush as possible when not in use, as you can see with the fairing that's still there on the right-hand side of the photo and towards the front in actual reality. And the idea of this and various other ship-breaking solutions proposed at various points was essentially to help the ship avoid collisions in case of emergency. So the idea was if you are motoring along at full speed and you think, oh, I'm going to hit something and there's not enough time to stop conventionally, you can unleash the brakes. Uh, you unlock the uh, mechanisms holding it in, which you can see there. there's a kind of a metal wire there um, holding it because obviously you don't want the thing to just flap back against the other sort of flap completely 180 against the hull and the brake pops open it provides massive amounts of drag which in theory significantly slow or ideally stop your ship in a relatively short distance or if you deploy just the one that would allow you to turn significantly tighter significantly faster going one way or the other now <laughs> It has a certain amount of merit to the idea. However, it ran into the square cube law in two separate ways. Because if you are running these things on, you know, a 
ship weighing a few hundred tons that's maybe going six to eight knots, then a large-ish ship break like this, one that occupies most of the underwater uh, portion of the side uh, vertically, that will stop such a vessel pretty much immediately. The problem is when you get to much larger vessels, like the battleship Indiana, whilst the ship's dimensions in terms of length have only gone up by about a third compared to a Bainbridge-class destroyer, let's say, and whilst the beam might have gone up by a factor of three, and therefore the draft has also increased, as you can tell, rough, roughly speaking, by the size of the men next to it, um, this the cost break is about three times the height of what you could physically fit on a Bainbridge class. The displacement has gone up considerably more. An Indiana class well, battleship, uh, the pre-dreadnought that is, displaces m far more than 20 to 25 times as much as a Bainbridge class destroyer. So the surface area of a Lagos shipwreck as fitted to the battleship might have only gone up by a factor of three or four times in terms of overall surface area, but it's trying to stop 20 to 25 times the mass, and so it is considerably less effective. The other problem, which also involves the square cube law, is when it comes to speed, if you're traveling at eight knots for a, on a given vessel, the amount of energy that's involved due to obviously having to force your way through the water is considerably less, much less than half what you need to travel at 16 knots, and it's much, much, much less than a quarter of what you need to travel at 32 knots. So if you trial it on a small, relatively slow vessel, you'll get very good results. If you trial it on a much bigger vessel that's also able to go considerably faster, the total energy involved is such that the Lacoste brake would have to be so, so, so much bigger, at which point the forces involved will probably just rip the thing clean out of the hull. Plus, it was quite heavy because even at the size that it was, as you can see, it had to be heavily reinforced. So you've got to lose weight elsewhere, usually in terms of fuel, possibly even in terms of ammunition. Plus, as you can see, there are penetrations of the hull, which isn't good. And considering they wouldn't be needed very often, there was also a concern about them coming up with marine growth and then not being actually able to be deployed when they were needed to be deployed. So all in all, they're a good idea in principle, but they turn out to be a little bit impractical in actual practice for large warships. And small warships, which you might think could therefore make use of them, tend to be much better at dodging. Nathapron Hongsheron asks, Main turret placements. What's the benefit of having sea turret being super firing like in Megami? All other ships with more than one turret forward, like Nelson or Miyoko, have B turret super firing because it gives the best arc of fire, but I don't understand the benefit of Megami's arrangement. Less weight up front for stability? Also, for battleships with five turrets, why did some nations have Q turret pointing forward whilst some pointing backward? The US in, and Japan in particular, with New York and Amagi, wouldn't making Q turret close to X turret reduce the area that needed to be covered by a thicker belt? Having C instead of B super firing does reduce the amount of weight right up forward, which can be important on cruisers who have fairly slim bows, as opposed to battleships where the bow tends to be somewhat thicker around the place, the area where you've got the turrets. In theory, it also allows for slightly better forward arcs of fire albeit, as you mentioned, at the expense of uh, B turret not having quite as good an aft arc of fire, because if you've got this you know, lower, lower, upper set for ABC, then at least in theory, if A turret can take it, at longer ranges where the guns need to be elevated, B can fire over A, whilst obviously C can always fire over B and A, which means that you could at medium to long ranges bring all of Megami's forward guns to bear, whereas if you have a raised B turret, then C turret practically never is going to be in a position where you can actually fire direct forward or in a significant arc forward, which is perhaps more important for cruisers than it is for battleships and would reflect an advance over something like the Miyoko's. It also depends on what you're doing with the superstructure. So if you look at the Miyoko's, the forward superstructure, and indeed the superstructure generally, is much reduced compared to Megami's. 
Whereas on Megami, as you can see in this photo, that has this kind of fared lower forward superstructure that integrates into the barbette for C. Now you can't do that if C is down on the main deck level, um, but if you have a reduced superstructure, therefore reduced superstructure weight, then you can drop C down and elevate B for the better aft firing arcs. Well, all round, almost all round firing arcs that you mentioned. So as ever, there's a degree of compromise involved. With the battleships with an, an amidships Q turret and why they point forward or back, a lot of this depends on what's going on below decks. It's not going to really reduce the area that needs to be covered by a thick armor belt unless you have different thicknesses of armor protecting your machinery and your magazines, in which case flipping Q turret around to point forward would, yes, bring that magazine closer to your aft magazines, presumably X and Y, at which point then the magazine protection armor can be a bit thicker um, because it covers a short distance as opposed to the machinery space. However, it's not going to shorten the citadel length overall because the machinery space is still there. Now, as for reasons why you, other reasons why you might have it flipped forward or flipped backwards, you've got to account for things such as how much machinery is down there. If the machinery is taking up more space, then that might be a motivation to put Q turret facing forward because then the barbette is further back, which opens up another few dozen feet for machinery like boiler rooms and stuff without interfering with the magazines. Whereas if your boiler space is a little bit more compact, then you can turn Q around the other way. The other thing is where exactly do you want to fire? Now, if in some cases this may not make too much odds, but if you've got a crowded superstructure or a very tight fit for Q turret, it could make a difference in the in those cases, a uh, Q turret that's facing backwards will obviously have very fine angles firing aft, but would be somewhat restricted in its forward firing arcs, whereas a Q turret that is facing forwards would have very good firing arcs forward, but more restricted firing arcs when it's facing aft. So, you know, are you ex where are you expecting to have Q turret need to fire. And of course, if it's expecting mostly to fire on the broadside, it probably doesn't make much odds. So a lot of it is going to come down more importantly to that internal machinery space layout. And finally, Dr. DM Platt asks, would the Royal Navy have been better off in World War I if they had built destroyers and small cruisers in place of the post-invincible battle cruisers? Not really, because once you've got the battle cruiser genie out of the bottle you're not really going to be able to put it back in again and once you've built three invincibles well what are the germans building in exchange well they're starting off with von der tan and then you've got the two Moltkes as well and much as you can debate the comparative combat power of the lions um, and tiger etc against the german battle cruisers it's not exactly groundbreaking to say that the Moltkes and von der Tan are somewhat more suited for combat against their peers than the Invincibles are, which means that if the Germans build replies, which they will, and then you stop building them, the Germans have a battle cruiser advantage, which then means that come a big battle, assuming even that the Germans stop with Moltke, Goben, and von der Tan, which they probably won't. You know, why would they? There's no reason for them to stop. They can build Seidelitz and the Deflingers if they want. Um, then the Germans will be in a position to blow through the British fleet screen in exactly the way that battle cruisers are capable of doing, and the British won't have anything that they can really do to stop them. Um, so, yes, a fleet of small cruisers and Destroyers might be very attractive for various other reasons, but if you're going to be looking at taking on the high seas fleet, you've got to have both the numbers and the combat power of ships to take on the German battle cruisers. And once you've built some, other people are going to build them as well. And well, that's it for this week's Dry Dock. Thank you very much for listening. Uh, if you are listening to this on the day of public release, i.e. on Sunday, then I am hopefully 
all things being equal, somewhere in the skies over either the UK or Europe, heading on my way to Australia. So hope to see some of you out there on in the upside down lands where I shall be grimly hanging onto the ground for dear life. See you all there.